Right, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, the title of my presentation this evening is the Falklands 1982 War. Uh, and I just introduced the Falklands uh, on my first slide here to show that there's two main islands, East, West Falklands and East Falklands. And most of the story, or nearly all of the story tonight, will centre around the East Falklands. Uh, there was one post office at Port Stanley on East Falklands, and there was another post office called Fox Bay, which you can see uh, down here uh, on the West Falklands. Now, my, my presentation this evening is going to be split into four parts. As you all, most of you will remember the actual story of the Falklands War and the mammoth task force that was sent down all the various ships to the Falklands. So the first section I will show is mail from these task force ships. Uh, then obviously they eventually get very close to the Falklands and there are the land battles. So uh, my second session, section will relate to mail sent by soldiers in that land force. Whilst all this was happening, the Falkland Islanders still wanted to write uh, to other people on the islands and also to friends or relatives in the United Kingdom. So hence, Falkland Island mail uh, from the locals is of philatelic importance and that forms section three of my presentation. And then finally, last but not least, obviously the Argentinian troops, there is, there is examples of mail sent from Argentina to the troops in the Falklands and obviously the other way around from the troops back to Argentina. So those are the four sections uh, within this display this evening. However, we start way back before 1982 and we see a postcard here. Uh, it's sent from Argentina to a Mr. Hurst in Stanley, Falkland Islands and the message uh, it's a picture of an Argentine naval ship, a destroyer, and it says, Dear Mr. Hurst, so you ask if the Falklands are worth troubling about. Here is one of our ships, Fear Our Navy. So there are even ramblings of it in 1905. There were all sorts of convent postal conventions happening between uh, 1905 or certainly from 1940 on to 1980. I've cut those out to make it a uh, just center really on 1982 war. But here we sh I show an unusual document. Don't think many of these have survived. S printed and sent out from Stanley, Port Stanley, the capital in February 1968 uh, from unofficial members of the Falkland Islands Executive Council to uh, members of Parliament, are you aware that negotiations are now proceeding between British and Argentine governments, which may result in the handling over of the Falklands to the Argentinians? So the, Argent the island's inhabitants have never yet been consulted regarding their future, and they certainly do not want to become Argentinians. Uh, that's just another feel for it. However, in the 1960s, there was rumblings uh, and Argentine fishing boats were getting too close to the islands, etc, etc. So following a request from the Falkland Islanders, a small naval party of Royal Marines was assigned to the Falklands in 1966. The unit was usually about 60 to 70 in strength and their time period of duty was 12 months. This was known as Naval Party. 8901. Now I show on the right hand side, first of all, that there is a cachet for that naval party and you can occasionally get mail with that cachet on it. But I thought this was much more exciting. It's the only cover I've seen actually addressed to it. OHMS, exclusive to the officer commanding that party and with the word secret all over it and well sealed with sellotape. If you look towards the lower left hand side of the cover, you can see that 
but it's cash aids from the UK military HQ at Northwood in London with the personal cachet of the fleet commander. Why was it secret? What were the contents? Unfortunately, they had long gone uh, when this cover came onto the market, but it would have been very interesting to find out what it was all about. So we now come to the actual Falklands War itself. The Argentinians occupied the islands on the 2nd of April 1982, and the islands were re captured by the British on the 14th of June 1982. Fortunately, there is a, an island in the Atlantic which proved a very important staging post for this campaign, and that was Ascension Island. Troops were assigned there and they had an FPO number 777. Uh, I've seen this date stamp in both red and black, seen being used quite a lot in black, in red rather, and my guess is that it really means, if it was cancelled in red, it means postpaid. This was from a member of the tactical supply wing at Ascension Island and addressed to RAF Lineham in Wiltshire. This was actually sent after the war was over, but it shows that uh, there was, the military was still uh, involved within the Ascension Island. Now we start to look at the task force mail. <laughs> at the time, a lot of philatelic covers were created uh, for stamp collectors, for ad lists, and these would have the cachet of the ship on the bottom left-hand side, usually in red, uh, and I've got examples for HS Hermes, but usually they were very philatelic. The actual troops on board just wrote forces mail on the front of the cover, and then wrote the address and they also wrote their name and from which ship they were on fortunately on the back so at least i know which ship they've come from so this if you look at the on the back of this cover which is shown on the right hand side it's from hms hermes dfbo ships london uh, and it's addressed to sovereign roses presumably he was contacting them to send roses to his partner. M much of the mail seemed to be sent at the standard first class letter rate at the time, which was 15 and a half pence. This would have been sent, uh, routed via Ascension, and then flown from Ascension to London, where it was postmarked with this London machine cancel. Uh, date stamp for the 22nd of June. But again, considering this is a large ship containing a lot of troops, very few examples of commercial mail are recorded for this particular ship. Now, this is an exciting, well, to me, an exciting cover. Uh, I collect to other areas of wartime uh, philately, and one of the things that are quite fascinating are different sensor marks and different sensor tapes. Officially in the task force, censoring did not take place at all. But when we dig deep, deeper into the records, there was that censoring took place on one ship, which is the HMS Fearless, but it only took place on mail sent whilst it was between sailing between England and Ascension. So then it would be taken off at Ascension and sent back to England. Having said that, in what was it now? 40 years of collecting this material. This is the only censored cover I have ever seen. Uh, and when it was offered to me, I sort of grabbed it. Uh, there's no name on the back of the envelope, so hence you need the contents. It's from a Marine Davis to his mother, and you can see the letter on the right hand side. And I'm sure you don't need to be an expert to fill in the words which were cut out. Now we're at the, I presume is Ascension Island. And then at the bottom bit, uh, I can't tell you much numbers and dates, uh, but it's the most ships I've ever seen in my life, not just ships, but I presume it is, but also airplanes and helicopters would have been put in there. Uh, so an unusual item uh, of censored, British censored mail from this campaign. Then I move on to other ships. This is from HMS Antrim, which was a destroyer. But this ship was involved in the recovery of South Georgia. If you remember, really, that was where it all started. 
uh, and they got that South, uh, Argentina submarine, the Santa Fe, there, and it was sort of trapped in South Georgia. Uh, this ship also supported the main landing at San Carlos Water, which we'll hear about later on. It suffered a bomb, but this bomb did not explode. Uh, I, this was sent, uh, you can see the address on the right hand side. It's got HMS Antrim, BFBO Ships London. Uh, it was sent from a sailor to his wife in Suffolk. And again, you can see the London Maritime Machine Council for the 9th of June. So again, this would have uh, gone back via Ascension to London where it's postmarked and then on to Suffolk. Atlantic Conveyant, I show on the left-hand side a cover uh, sent in on the 8th of May, 1982. Ship was sunk on the 25th of May, 1962, so 1982. Uh, and it, this is obviously a philatelic cover on the left. It's got the cachet, uh, SS Atlantic Conveyor Liverpool with the various bits of information attached to it. But having said that, uh, even to get a cover from one of the ships which was sunk is uh, quite difficult. But the one on the right is quite, was quite exciting find. Uh, I was in uh, Stampex, uh, maybe 83, I would think, and I was a dealer stand and a guy came up to the dealer and he was showing them what to me looks like a whole series of Machin covers with first class Machin stamps on 15 and a half piece stamps on it and I thought no wonder the dealer didn't want it anyway I was intrigued so uh, I casually walked up to this guy and said what are you trying to sell the gentleman and he said oh I've got this I've got one or two commercial covers to do with the, the 1982 task force so I had a look at them and this one was extremely interesting because it's addressed to the Atlantic conveyor. And it was sent on the 22nd of May. Ship sunk on the 25th, so it wouldn't have got through. So hence the word Atlantic conveyor was deleted in manuscript. And it was just uh, BFPO 666 uh, added. So again, a very lucky find. But to get mail addressed into the task force was very difficult because obviously most of the sailors collected the mail and threw the envelopes away. They just wanted the letter inside. HMS Coventry, well, that's an even harder one to find, uh, because this was a destroyer, which was also sunk on the 25th of May. Uh, you can see the address on the back uh, from Welby uh, and HMS Coventry, uh, again addressed to this Sovereign Roses in Guernsey, requesting obviously another batch of flowers for his partner. Uh, this is a very scarce commercial cover from the country. Only two covers have been actually recorded from this ship. Then we get the lovely story, HMS Brilliant. Now this is a commercial letter, but because of who he was sending it to, they put the ship's office HMS Brilliant uh, and stamp on the cover. It's addressed to a Lieutenant Colonel Hogan in uh, Fort Hood in Texas. Uh, and this is the reply to his letter. Thank you for your letter and thank you for your interest. These islands may be little islands, but nobody has the right simply to walk in with a gun and explain that they're now colonized. I do hope the world will understand our point of view and that of the unfortunate islands. We do not intend to hand pe the people there over to gunmen and have a slight, we have a slightly stubborn streak on that point. Uh, unfortunately, the name of the captain is Captain Coward, but we can't help that one. So it's on uh, HMS Brilliant note paper. It's addressed to America. Uh, it's got the ship's cachet on it. It went through London maritime marking. And strangely enough, it's got some uh, uh, Falkland stamps on it. But uh, it didn't get through London until the 20th of June, uh, 1982. But an unusual item. SS Canberra, well, this was actually a bit of a cheat because this is on its return voyage. This was unusually a postcard uh, sent after the liberation, post free to Leeds. 
But uh, initially after the uh, liberation of the islands, the Canberra took 4,000 Argentine POWs uh, to the port of uh, Puerto Madryn in South, in South America, then returned to the Falklands and then departed for the United Kingdom on the 25th of June. And this was then written on the 1st of July uh, during its voyage back. It was then forwarded via Ascension and then flown by Asc uh, from Ascension onwards. And it's got, you can just see a bit of the London Maritime Mail and stamp. Uh, and it's just a quick me message uh, to his mother saying, I'm looking forward to seeing you in a few weeks time. Another one from Sovereign Roses, but this is actually from QE2 and it's a little bit different. Uh, QE2 had obviously got a lot of their own note paper and special envelopes on board the ship when the troops took the, the ship over. But this has got the uh, logo of the Cunard QE2 on the back of the envelope. And you'll see that it's endorsed forces airmail, but it's got a different date stamp on it. This ship carried a, was, had a forces post office actually set up in the library and it got its own FPO number to single circle date stamp FPO 941. Uh, and this was eventually transferred to the Fearless just prior to the landing. Uh, and that's a little bit story that comes in a bit later on. So again, address to Guernsey. Again, a cover sent post free from England to Captain Hayes, who was a Roman Catholic chaplain uh, with the 5th Infantry Brigade. And again, it's unusual to find a cover addressed uh, into the task force and rather nice it's addressed to Queen Elizabeth II, BFBO 666, sent on 26th of May. Then we come to a smaller vessel, which uh, was actually a Royal Marine Auxiliary Service tug, and it was actually the first ship of the task force to leave England. Uh, it actually was, went straight to South Georgia, first of all, and it arrived in South Georgia on the 8th of May. Uh, and it was then involved in raising this uh, Argentine submarine, which it took over two weeks to sort out. This cover was then sent, therefore sent from South Georgia. It's got a Falkland Island, South Georgia uh, postmark, as the post office there hadn't been destroyed or the date stamps hadn't been destroyed. Uh, and uh, it's also got the cache of RMNS Typhoon on the back, as you can see on the top of the cover. Uh, it worked alongside the Canberra then in South Georgia, and then it sailed onto the Falklands on the 16th of June. It's the only cover I've ever seen during that particular period uh, in South Georgia. Then another cover on the right uh, from the master of RMS Typhoon uh, with the ship's cache on again, addressed to Mr. High in Woking, Surrey. But this is nice because it's on a registered letter uh, and we get the London Inland Section uh, registration label. This was sent in September 1982, uh, but the tug was still in the Falklands area at that time. Now we're talking about South Georgia. This is an actual letter from the troops based out in South Georgia, which was M Company 42 Commando Group. Uh, that's the actual, on the left-hand side is the air letter addressed from Dave Tennyson to his father in Bridlington in Yorkshire. Again, they've used the Falkland Island, South Georgia date stamp, and you can just see behind it, so that it doesn't get surcharged en route, a framed cachet, which is inscribed in blue, official paid. This to date is the only recorded example of mail from the, uh, the Marines in, whilst they were down in South Georgia. Uh, I'll give you a few seconds to read the letter, which just says, Dear Dad, uh, I hope you've got the telegram all right. I couldn't say much as we're restricted to 30 words. Uh, no idea what the reaction is in England to all this, as I haven't seen an English paper since we are left. We've got 60 days of rations ashore. All the Argentine prisoners have left by boat. Uh, 
and then South Georgia, well, obviously was liberated on the 24th of April 1982. So it's enabled them to do the work in South Georgia in May. Now we're going to go on to the second section, which is the land campaign. Uh, I've put in the red, oh, sorry about this. The red arrow or pointer on the right hand side just points to the town of Stanley or Port Stanley. And the red sort of circular square shows the position of Darwin settlement and Goose Green which two power are involved with the, the big battle there. And the landing places were around Ajax Bay and Port San Carlos, which are again shown with this sort of pinky blob. And if we want a more detailed picture of the land campaign and where the ships are at the time, we can see them on this particular picture here, which shows you that where all the various ships were located. Uh, the important one really is the Fearless, which you can see was situated here. That took over the FPO 941 date stamp from the QE2. The QE2 was kept way away from uh, military activities. And again, this shows you a bit closer where the various military groups uh, landed and continued their way across the Falklands. Here we've got an air letter uh, sent from a marine aboard in HMS Intrepid. This was sent prior to the St. Carlos landings on the 21st. This was actually written on the 17th of May. And again, it had a London Maritime Mail date stamp when it was routed through London on the 8th of June. Uh, and you can see it's from uh, three commando brigade Royal Marines, which is on the reverse of this uh, air letter. Part of it says, hi, Mark, just a quick line to let you know uh, I'm still OK and living. I can't tell you anything which is going on that due to the security risk. So that limits our news slightly. So that's just before the military campaign on the land started. We then move on to one of the letters from Nick van der Waal. He obviously, he actually was a stamp collector, so it was very useful because he must have told his wife, because these were just air letters to his wife to keep them all. Uh, again, this is a scarce air letter. He was aboard HMS Fearless. He was actually an interpreter, uh, so he could speak Spanish, and he was involved in interpreting some of the prisoners, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This was written just before the troops made landfall at St. Carlos. 3.30 a.m., his letter reads, we are slowly approaching the beaches. It has been a very tense day since we crossed the total exclu exclusion zone. However, the weather has been kind, the choppy seas and mist preventing any, preventing any enemy flying. We have been action stations all day. Now the landing craft are being loaded for the first wave of troops. All appears to be very quiet, which is very good news. I am now completely ready. Arms were issued earlier and I await the call forward. I imagine I will go ashore after first light. HMS Fearless is very crowded with 1,400 troops on board, just anchored off the beach. The suspense is tremendous. I just hope we get away with it. And then fine humorous comment. However, the food has deteriorated in quality and quantity. But I think that's a lovely item just before the make landfall. Then we actually, uh, this is the first uh, email, the first airmail I've got from a soldier uh, after he's landed on the Falklands. This is at Ajax Bay, we saw in the diagram earlier on, the map earlier on. And now they're using a new date stamp here, which is a double circle inscribed field post office 141. And this was only used as Ajax Bay from the 25th of May to the 9th of June. And very few examples are recorded. This is from a Marine, um, Alec Munro, to his wife in Southport. 
uh, and again, you can see three power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, his letter writes, "We are now firmly established on shore in defence positions. I was the first British soldier to enter San Carlos. Over the last few days, we have had regular air attacks. The weather is not as bad as expected, and the locals have been great, bringing around coffee and soup." Yeah, this jumps all the time. Yeah. Another cover, uh, this is actually from St. Carlos still. Uh, and this was sent on the 5th of June, but by the 5th of June, the task force uh, had yonked further eastwards and they'd taken their sort of headquarters with them. And that included the uh, FBO date stamp. So this had to sort of go back uh, and was canceled in England on the 29th of June. And again, uh, this was sent on the 5th of June, where it looks as if things are going to be sorted out okay. In fact, by the time you get this letter, I'm sure it'll be over. And obviously it would have been the 29th of June. It was liberated two weeks prior to that. Uh, but it's interesting. Uh, I have been ashore since the 25th of May. We had to leave the Sir Galahad in a hurry. So we had a bomb through, uh, come through the side, which unfortunately failed to go off. And he says it's so lightly, but of course the Sir Galahad uh, did eventually sink. They took us off to the Intrepid for the night. The following day we returned uh, to the ship, etc. We spent Tuesday night at Ajax Bay in an old freezer building. And at the moment we're camped in a small field. Uh, we are waiting to go on to Teal Inlet where the rest of the headquarters have now arrived. I've been trying to get to Goose Green where the earlier battle was since it was taken but have not been able to do so and again some of the people there weren't in too good shape could a shape after being locked up in the hall for a month. We now move on to Teal Inlet uh, this again is part of the Van der Waal correspondence uh, this was sent on the 11th of June you can see the FBO 141 date stamp on the right hand of this item uh, this FPO uh, Forces Post Office was actually in a tent. Uh, the date stamp was only used at Teal Inlet for six days until the 16th of June, and then it was transferred to Port Stanley. Uh, and the Port Stanley Post Office after liberation was split into two parts, a civilian part and a military part. Uh, Nick van der Baal states, uh, I've just seen Malcolm, he lost everything he brought with him in the Sir Galahad, which was attacked and sunk last night. Where the hell are the aircraft to give us cover? Anyway, Malcolm is safe. But again, a scarce cover. And then eventually, the Falklands was liberated on the 14th of June, 1982. Uh, and this is a cover with a 141 date stamp, which is now in use at Fort Stanley Post Office. Uh, for the 19th of June uh, from Corporal Wickham to his parents in Kent. Uh, the post office actually opened only the one day before that on the 18th. And the message uh, reads, we have been moving around Port San Carlos, Darwin, Mount Misery, Goose Green, Fitzroy Settlement and Mount Kent. And his final comment in his letter is, I am now sleeping in a small cow shed. Unusual. Not all the, uh, well, some of the uh, Marines uh, ended up with illnesses at the end of the uh, campaign. And this is a air letter sent from Port Stanley Hospital uh, from Marine Davis to Yorkshire. Um, and he says, thank God it's all over. We hope that's the way it will stay. I am in, uh, I'm in Port Stanley Hospital recovering from pneumonia and pleurisy. Don't worry, I'm reco recovering rather rapidly. It is snowing every day. In his actual comment, he says, I'm wearing my Marine's cap and that's beret and that's helping me as well. We have 1,800 prisoners to take back to Argentina. And then forces mail now uh, from the SS Canberra. This is again from Nick van der Waal, the intelligence officer. 
he sailed on home on SS Canberra uh, with 4,000 troops and three commando brigade. Uh, and this arrived back on the 12th of July, that this message was written on board the Canberra, taken ashore before the ship's departure, and then forwarded by air to London, so that it's got the, the London different what, maritime mail date stamp for the 29th of June. Just a summary, one sentence within that message. Uh, I'm not sure how, in that any of us believe the whole thing is finished when all the odds, distance and numbers were against us. Then example of civilian mail from liberated Darwin. Uh, obviously it went via the interlinked with the troops. This is from a guy called Brooke Hardcastle. He was the farms manager acting on behalf of the Falkland Island Company, and he was resident in Darwin. Uh, and he's writing to Mr. Britton in the Falkland Island Company headquarters, which are in Whitechapel High Street in London. Uh, it's interesting that uh, this has got a FPO 941 single circle date stamp over stamped with the London Maritime Mail Council. So this, he wrote the letter on the 9th of June. It then went to St. Carlos Water uh, and to HMS Fearless, which had still got that date stamp, because it had been transferred from the QE2 to HMS Fearless. So it was date stamped in, uh, with HMS Fearless, and it then was flown uh, to London, where it got the later date stamp. Uh, and uh, he was one of the 115 residents held under arrest at Goose Green. And, and another letter I've got as part of the same correspondence, he describes all the damage done to the building at Goose Green. But again, a, a, a difficult cover to find. We now go on to the next section, which is the Argentine civilian mail. Uh, this cover, sorry, air letter was written on the 30th of March by a lady called Sally Blake. And she sent it to Mr. Og Eric Ogden, who was an MP in the House of Commons at Westminster in London. Uh, it was uprated with a Falklands definitive, and you can see the date stamp the 1st of April 1982. However, it obviously didn't leave the post office on the first or the second. And of course, on the second, we had the Argentine invasion. Post office was then closed and, and only reopened on the 6th of April. So you can see lower down the large circle cancel is inscribed Elas Malvinas Republica Argentina, 6th of April, 1982. So events overtook her little message. Her message says, Tim, which was her husband, went to New York for Anglo-Argentine talks at the end of February. It doesn't seem to have done any good. How depressing it is. And then she writes, this is my country. I do not belong anywhere else. This is another cover sent on the 1st of April, 1982. This was obviously delivered or collected as a PO box in Stanley uh, before the Argentine invasion. Uh, it's addressed to a lady, Joan Bound. Five pence was the standard internal letter rate at the time. Uh, so it's just nice to get a cover dated one day before the Argentine invasion. Now yeah, then we get the Argentine invasion uh, and obviously at the post office at the time of the Argentine invasion, when they closed it, there were lots of envelopes uh, to be forwarded to various destinations uh, with stamps on, but had, hadn't been postmarked. The Argentines allowed these covers to go forwards, but they deleted the stamps with Biro, just like our post of postmen do now here. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. And alongside it, they put the Argentine date stamp, he inscribed Ilas Venus 9409 Republica Argentina on both the covers. And you can see both 5p rates. And one's addressed to Goose Green, the other locally in Port Stanley. The current letter rate in 1982 to England, the MO letter rate was 13p. This also obviously got caught 
uh, being sent just before the invasion. So the 13 piece stamp was just deleted in Biro. This was obviously sent out uh, on the first day of the reopening of the post office, I would have thought. So I haven't got round to putting an Argentine date stamp on it, but it arrived because of an English date stamp on the back for the 17th of April. So that proves that irrespective of the fact that the Argentines ran the postal service, mail was still allowed to go through to any destination in the world. Here unusually is a postcard, uh, 10p rate to England. Uh, and again, a very early date, the stamps again, the British, the Falkland Island stamps deleted in Barrow, uh, alongside the 9409 Les Malvinas date stamp for the 7th of April. And it's a postcard of the Upland Goose Hotel. By the 8th of April, however, the Argentine authorities had got loads of Argentine stamps uh, into the post office. Uh, and although it looks a thousand pesos, looks a lot of money, a thousand pesos just equals 5p. And this is addressed locally to a vicar at the deanery in Port Stanley. And the stamp obviously cancelled with it, then with the Malvina state stamp. A later one here. An air letter sent on the 29th of April 1982 to Holiton and Devon. Uh, this has got 2,800 pesos stamps. Uh, and again, the stamps cancelled with the Elas Malvina state stamp. And the message within the uh, air letter says, I have not put my name on the back of the air letter because we have to then to put the words Elas Malvinas, Malvinas Republic Argentina which he was not going to do. Another one here, uh, it looks philatelic, but it isn't, because it's addressed to Frank Mitchell, and he was the managing director of the Falkland Island Company at Whitechapel High Street, London. And again, a variety of Argentine stamps, uh, all, all hand stamped with the uh, Elas Malvina state stamp. Uh, postage rate here was 7,900 pesos, equivalent to 39 pence. Incoming mail, uh, very little of it, uh, tend to get some philatelic ones, but this was commercial, sent on the 21st of April from Ipswich, addressed to Mr John Fowler, the Education Administrator at Port Stanley. You can see there's a type message within the uh, air letter, uh, but it's also inscribed Port Stanley West Falklands, <coughs> which the Argentinians did not accept, so they put a special two-line and stamp alongside inscribed 9409 Elas Malvinas Republica Argentina. And then finally, the final section is Argentine military mail. And first of all, we look at mail coming in from Argentina to the Malvinas, to Falklands. This is a registered express cover sent at 15,300 pesos, which is 71 pence addressed to the boss of the Argentine army in uh, Port Stanley, General Menendez. Note the address Puerto Argentina, which is Port Stanley. This is a uh, sad one. It's addressed to a soldier, uh, commander, commando based in the Falklands, sent registered from Argentina, terrible condition, but this was envelope was recovered from a trench near Moody Brook after liberation. So we presume he became a prisoner of war. Another one here from Buenos Aires to an engineer in the combat and support group, again addressed to Puerto Argentino. This is the, sorry, postage rate 1700. The postage, correct postage rate was 1000, uh, but they used a special stamp at 1700 pesos because it included the overprint Las Malvinas son Argentinas, uh, the Falklands are Argentinian. Another one here to a soldier in Puerto Soledad, Port Soledad, and this was returned to sender. Uh, it was to a conscript in the Falklands. The cover received two caches. All returned mail went through a sort of special uh, holding station 
inscribed a Fisano uh, postal number 17, uh, Ergesito Argentino, which is uh, Argentine uh, military. And you get the other cache, Al Remetente, uh, just returned. But again, very few of those exist, because most of them were destroyed. Quite a lot of mail, uh, military mail, was censored. Uh, and here we've got an example of a censored cover sent on the 30th of April. And on the reverse, you can see the cache censura naval Argentina uh, in black. It also appears in green and blue and some very strange uh, blue uh, printed censor tape uh, showing the cover was actually opened. This is another cover which was censored. This was sent very late on, on the 8th of June, 1982, and it was registered uh, to the Malvinas. And it's got a totally different censor hand stamp on it, Censura Militar. So this was a military one or an army one, whereas the other one was a naval one. Strangely enough, that's the only example I've ever seen of this particular censor mark. Uh, it was addressed to a soldier in the artillery group of 601 Air Defence. Then mail going the other way from Falklands to Argentina, finally. Uh, well, the Argentine soldiers, and they contain a lot of conscripts, weren't given any envelopes or writing paper to write the letters home. Uh, so I presume they just thought, well, they'll just be there for a short time and we'll replace them once we've sort of conquered them, etc., etc. Uh, but they raided the post office as they've taken it over, and this is an OHMS cover you can see on the back of it. He's put his name and address on the OHMS cover, which is nicked. Uh, no postage required for the Argentine troops. He's written back to his family in Argentina and with the Ilas Malvina state stamp. The next item is very similar. This is really on Her Majesty's service envelope. But this has also got a two line cachet correspondence of a soldier sank sin cargo, which means without charge. Uh, another two examples of that sent in April and May. The one on the right is a special is a official envelope from one of the uh, Marine Comp Argentine Marine companies. This cover is rather more unusual. It's only got the uh, red rectangular framed hand stamp, no date stamp or anything. Uh, this was, I'm not even gonna pronounce it in Spanish, but this was from the cache of the Argentine army military garrison. This was applied at their military base at Darwin in the Falklands. It didn't have to go back to Stanley to be postmarked. They just applied this hand stamp at the military base, put it on the plane and flew it out back to the fall, back to Argentina. Uh, but again, very few of those exist. Then the Argentine post office had a brainwave. They got a lot of old air letters of 11, 13 and 18 pesos values printed in the 1950s. So they thought, well, why don't we send those over to the Argentine troops in the Falklands so they can write back to their loved ones in Argentina. So this is what they duly did. Uh, and here's an example of the pink 13 pesos one, uh, sent post free, I mean, 13 pesos in 1982 would be absolute nothing. Uh, and then another one, this is more interesting was I translated or had it translated uh, this is the blue one, <coughs> 18 pesos. Uh, Hello, my love. I'm writing to you from the Malvinas. We arrived yesterday by aeroplane. Uh, I've hardly slept for two days. I won't even tell you how cold I was. It was dreadful. Uh, since though, we have been given very good jackets. My love, this is a very interesting and novel experience in that we are making history. When you teach the history of Argentina, 
and you mention you made those men who made her, you will be able to say the same about all of us who are here and among them your fiance or your future husband. I feel proud to be able to participate in this heroic exploit. I hope all will end well and we'll be able to marry when we get out of here. Uh, I must stop writing, my fingers are turning to ice. Yours, Horatio. Don't think things went quite as he expected. And then uh, eventually, just before the liberation, Argentina printed off special air letters, which are inscribed on the right, top right, Francio Pagoda, uh, which is basically free postage. And it's got inscribed Servicio Extraordinario. There are two different types of these. I just show the one here, uh, addressed back to the uh, Argentina on the June the 9th, just a few days before the liberation. And that, gentlemen, completes my presentation on the Falklands War.